Hello and welcome everyone to uh, the ninth installment of the GoEquipped uh, webinar series, which we will conclude to today uh, with two really uh, uh, internationally recognized neuroscientists and uh, their experiences with the uh, equipped quality system. So first we will hear from Martin Kaas from the University of uh, Groningen. He is a uh, professor of uh, translational neuroscience and uh, is also an, an expert in uh, the uh, psychiatric disorders and uh, ge genetics uh, uh, with this. And uh, he is also currently, I think, the uh, president of the European College of Neuropharmacology. And um, so, and has been also involved in the uh, equipped quality uh, uh, consortium when it was in existence in uh, um, 2014 uh, and 2017. So, and our second speaker um, is uh, Piotr Popik, also a professor of, neuro, of neuroscience. Um, and uh, he comes from the Polish Academy of Science in Krakow. And uh, yeah, so he has also published more than 140 publications um, and is also an expert on uh, the uh, um, on treatment of mood disorders. So, um, and he has also experience with the EKIP system. Uh, so, uh, both of you are welcome, and please, Martin, uh, go first, and we're looking forward to an interesting uh, experiences. Thanks. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I hope you can hear me okay and can see the slides. I see two thumbs up, so many thanks. Uh, thank you for this very kind introduction. It's actually a pleasure for me to do this uh, in, 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 in co-creation with uh, Piotr, because I actually been to Krakow before, so I know the Institute also. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. So today I was asked to present on our work of implementing the uh, quality management system that was actually developed through the Equipped Consortium. Um, and what I would like to share with you today is basically how to apply such a system in an academic setting and also to show you some case examples of how we address some of the items uh, related to the quality management system. So first of all, I would like to refer to the original paper by Anton Bespolov. Uh, who basically put forward this uh, quality management system. And one of the statement is really the aim is boosting innovation by ensuring the generation of robust and reliable preclinical data. Well, in the discussion of developing such a management system, it was also the scientists putting an, an extra a sentence there saying, well, you know, it's great to have such a system, but it also should be lean, effective, and not becoming a burden that could negatively impact the freedom to explore scientific questions. So it should have both. It should be robust, bring and bringing innovation, but also try to reduce burden as much as possible. And with that view, I think a very nice system was, uh, was developed um, over time and now being implemented in our laboratory. Just a short recap, what is this all about? So basically the quality management system puts forward some core requirements for each of the labs to implement. And they are numbered by these 18 uh, uh, items, falling on the various categories, ranging from the research team, quality culture, data integrity, research processes, continuous improvements and sustainability. But before diving into the way that we have implemented this in our lab, I, I should also sh show you a little bit where, I, where I'm living, where this has been implemented. And uh, if you want to read more, in fact, about how we did it, actually Maria, uh, who was a PhD student in the EQIP project, actually wrote a little paper as a commentary to the BESPOLOV paper, where we actually showed how this system was implemented in, into an academic setting. 
Now, first about our lab. So we're in the University of Groningen, which is in the north of the Netherlands. And uh, we're housed in the Faculty of Science and Engineering that has 10 different research institutes. And I'm housed in one of those institutes, namely the Groningen Institute for Evolutionary Life Sciences, where uh, 45 research PIs are present, doing all kinds of biological research, ranging from genetics to theoretical biology to neurobiology. And in fact, I'm part of, as you would expect, a part of the neurobiology expertise group that has 12 research PIs. And on a sunny day, our, our building looks like the picture below. So, it, so you get a little bit of a sense of where actually we have been implementing this. Then I'm a PI in those group of 12 PIs and my behavioral neuroscience group consists of approximately 17 people entailing postdocs and PhD students. And as a group, we try to work on trans diagnostic and translational studies, focusing on the biology of sensory processing and social functioning. And for me, such a uh, uh, quality management system actually turned out to be very useful, considering that you have a lab where many people are involved at different levels, and also have where there is a lot of turnover of people coming in and going out. To understand a little bit, a little bit of my research, so we really have an integrated experimental research approach focusing on major research areas of various brain disorders indicated here. We study various sub subjects ranging from preclinical mouse studies to human patients and healthy controls. And we do this as, at, at various levels. So we do this at the level of behavior, EEG, and molecular. And in the human setting, we focus mainly on digital phenotyping and genetics. And the quality management system currently is being implemented for the preclinical area, which was also the focus of the equipped consortium. So why to implement such a quality system? Because of course it's, a, it's work, but we also realize that there may actually be a lot of benefits and the actual relatively burden of implementing such a system was minimized since in the Netherlands where I'm housed, actually you have already quite a large strict uh, number of regulations with respect to the use of animals in research. So we felt that this may be actually not such a burden or, on our end. And indeed, we mapped out for this uh, commentary paper the various items and indicated exactly how much time we actually needed to complete these items. And as you can see, there were already quite some that actually didn't need any time because we already had those present in our organization. Then the vast majority took about 30 minutes to complete, but there was two and especially number six that actually took us most of the work. And that really had to do with all the documentation, actually to make sure that all we're doing and all the processes that are in place are actually documented and actually can be followed from one person to the other. So overall, the time to spend in, on our end to, to complete all these items were relatively easy to do. Well, of course, why to implement such a system? If you work in, uh, in Europe and you work with a lot of different uh, partners in consortia, there's actually a need to facilitate the communication between partners. So it helps if you have an aligned system where the vision and goals of the, uh, the, the project are, of course, achieved in time and where people can rely on each other's performance, including scientific, uh, scientific integrity matters. Furthermore, we're in an academic setting, so we have to train students and new researchers and provide the best research environment. So we figured that implementing such a system would also help us to train uh, our students and better prepare them for the future. Furthermore, we would like to include, of course, good data practices, such as those related to data management and storage and, in, and improper research design among many others. So we really would like to be prepared to deal with all those aspects as good as possible. And of course, having a systematic approach to oversee the lab activities is, is much, much uh, wanted, considering already the, the overload on bureaucratic burden that we actually have to manage. So we're having a system in place that allows everybody to do and work according to the same standards is really helping to, to make this more efficient. 
So going through the whole system, we were, I think, one of the first labs uh, globally that was accredited for this uh, equipped uh, uh, quality management system. And of course, we were very pleased with that. But that doesn't end because uh, it's good to realize that such a quality management system is, a, is an ongoing process. There is constant reflection of the various processes. So what I'll do next is actually walk through a few of those items and try to give you some examples on how we address them in our lab and how we actually make them to work for us. So first item has to do that the process owner of the, of the system has to be identified. And in our case, uh, that's me. I, I, I'm, I'm the head of the lab. I'm the most consistent factor, I think, of our group. And I'm in charge of the vision and the supervision and the alignment with regulations and controlling the various steps. I was lucky to have two people on my side, both Maria and Renate, who were working in my lab, who really took a lot of work to implement and develop the quality system. But then, as I indicated earlier, people come and people go. So you need to develop su such a structure to maintain this that it actually has some sustainability. So after the leave of both Mar Maria and Renata, we implemented a revised structure where I actually uh, maintained as process owner the same uh, uh, charges and the same, same responsibilities. But I actually made a lab technician who is actually having a permanent position in my group, actually the process manager. So he's now really in charge of keeping the quality system up to date, ensuring continuity and supporting process innovators. So we uh, uh, introduced a third layer of people where we actually allow now people to innovate and, and to actually update the system. So we identify, for example, people now who are updating the system for in vitro uh, uh, studies, but also our digital uh, studies that we're doing in humans and try to see whether we can upgrade the system to a different level, making use of those process innovators. And they're appointed to very specific tasks. Then the communication processes. So of course, as a team, we have weekly team meetings where this is a recurring topic. So we, we, we discuss this item, it's a, it's a fixed item of our, our weekly agenda. And we created an e-lab journal environment, allowing us to electronically share all the documents that are relevant to the group. So there is an e-lab journal environment where all the documentation can be found. We also generated onboarding documents. So procedural and quality information of the lab separately for postdocs, PhDs and master's students because they have a different start of, uh, of, of, of ex expertise. So you need to explain the processes in different layers. And these are of course the living online documents which are constantly updated due to changes in the environment. And to the right, you simply see a very first page of the PhD introduction which can then be uh, found in our electronic uh, environment and will actually be read by the new PhD students at the very first week that they start. Then we had to define our quality objectives and that took some time. We really considered this carefully. So we said, well, you know, this quality management system should facilitate the design, planning and management of our studies. It should ensure that all lab members become active users of the system. It should make the system even more user friendly and easy. And we should have properly documented within the system and therefore traceable for others. And to make sure that all studies should be able to be reproduced at any time in the future and by any other member of the group. So this is basically an item where you as a group define your quality objectives. And this is the way we have addressed them for our group. A major item is the data management, this item six. Well, as a university, we have the luxury that there is a centralized <coughs> sorry, a database and regulation on the storage of data on a high level. And we are lucky that we actually have within our institute a data manager who's able to help and guide with these processes. Then we had to think about how to structure our, our database because we have many, many projects ongoing and different people working on different grants. So we structured our database based on projects. 
where all researchers get access to the project they're working on and none of the researchers have rights to delete files from the data storage. This can only be done by the process owner and the data manager. We generated readme files that are now populated with the data and explain how the data is organized. <coughs> and the data are linked to research protocols. And within a month, raw data records must be uploaded to the university server. So this is how we have currently done this. <clears throat> then the knowledge claim versus exploratory. So is this a, is this a confirmatory or an exploratory uh, research study? And that actually the, the, uh, led to be quite an extensive discussion in the group. Well, what, what should we now consider exploratory and confirmatory? And we actually went through the literature and actually uh, came to a definition for our own group, which now actually has been uh, specified as part of our study plan appendix, uh, where people can explicitly differentiate between a confirmatory or an exploratory uh, study for each of the outcome parameters that will be studied. Now, as part of our ethical procedure in the lab, we have to complete for each study, we have to do a so-called IVD protocol, which is a protocol which is mandatory under our ethical licenses, where we have to describe the study plan for each of the in vivo studies that we, uh, that we perform. Now, of course, this is an institute-wide document and what we did is actually we, we designed a special uh, section for our group to be compliant with the quality management system, <clears throat> where we now address the purpose of the study, the randomization and blinding methods, the data analysis plan, and the risk assessment, which belongs to item 15 of the quality management system. So basically what we did, we, we built an in-house pre-registration documentation section in an institute-wide mandatory uh, study protocol, specifically for the people who are submitting those proposals from my research group, and in order to comply with the, with the various items of the quality management system. Item 12 is about the protocols that must be available. So what we have done now is have all experimental protocols available via the eLab environment. So we have no more local storage of protocols and everybody is working in the same version. So we really have version control of each of the protocols. We also went through harmonization of pro behavioral protocols because different people were using slightly different behavioral protocols. So we really had a large discussion on how to align all these protocols and prepared a behavioral uh, SOP template so that all uh, information could be provided and we could all work according to similar standardized procedures. For example, with respect to habituation of the animals, but also with respect to the way of dosing pharmacological compounds. So those SOPs are now also being available and are version controlled in our eLab journal environment. Then item 16, which is an interesting one, has related to critical incidents and errors. This really depends on the culture you would like to have within your research group. And the one we have created is basically where we accept that errors can occur and we should openly discuss them. So in a weekly meeting, these things are actually being discussed. Um, we included it in the onboarding document. Uh, we asked people to write them down in the lab, lab journals and we are discussed them regularly at the team meetings. So we not only discuss the successes, we also uh, discuss the errors and incidents and have created a culture where it's accepted that people make mistakes, but also accept that we should discuss them to prevent them from happening in, in the future. A spot check is also quite critical. So what we have developed is a peer-to-peer -peer lab journal spot check. So every turn of the season, which actually is today, uh, our lab, our uh, group members are paired where they have the ability to spot check each other's lab journal and where they have to provide feedback to each other. Um, and this also, for example, uh, uh, led to the discovery that some people, we have of course quite an international group, um, and of course, people were, uh, for example, uh, writing down comments in, in, in Scandinavian language, which of course should not happen if you want other people to check your, your, um, 
your journals. So it really provided an infrastructure where everything is now written in English and where people can actually spot check and learn from each other's lab books. Another important aspect is actually to monitor the performance of your group members. And we thought this through quite carefully. And what we have done is actually implemented a project tracking system. So this really guides researchers through the various elements of the quality system, but also provide me with an opportunity to, to do spot checks and to make sure that people are actually compliant to the various steps. And they consist of four parts. First has to do with what to fill in before the start of the experiment. So the question is, is whether they have pre-registered, uploaded the form, indicate the start date, have to upload it our, our protocol, which is uh, necessary for our, our ethical approval. The supplement specifically designed, as I told you earlier, uploaded and, and some uh, information about ex vivo experiments. Then after completion, they have to indicate whether they have uh, completed the raw data and uh, whether the, the, the date and, and the date by which the raw data was actually backed up into our system. For, uh, before paper submission, is the paper submitted? Is the raw data backed up? Uh, is the raw data deleted from the computers? Is the, are the lab books uploaded? And are the arrive guidelines checklist uploaded? And then after publication, of course, it's also important to make sure that the paper gets published, the date, the D DOI, is the data sharing happening? If so, where is the data can be found? Are the secondary data? Uh, is our long-term sample storage in eLab? And also, for example, uh, end of date and storage date sample. So all these things are now being recorded by the individual experimenter. And I have access to this file so I can actually see where all the people are in, this, in the process. Now, to conclude, I would like to uh, put forward some lessons learned from our side. Uh, four, in fact. So first of all, the devil is not so bad as he is painted. So whenever you try to implement the quality management system, you always think this is a lot of work. But since already a lot of the, the items were operated in our, in, our, in our institute, this actually was quite relatively easy to implement. It's a self-reflection tool. So it's an ongoing process where we can reflect and have to consider the steps that we're doing on a weekly basis. Uh, so it's not an, a, a process that is ended. It's really an ongoing thing where you really as a group have to reevaluate and reassess the steps you're doing. Lesson number three is do not hesitate to ask for help. So for example, we have access to all kinds of research data and university repositories. So we really ask for some help for, from the East ICT uh, community to build our research depository as good as possible. <coughs> and they're very uh, helpful to do so. And to me, a very important lesson was this really helps to facilitate the onboarding process. If you have a lot of PhDs going out and coming in, it really matters if you have a systematic approach to how people get onboarded, how they learn about the research environment, what are the requirements, but also that they learn what type of quality standards are, are tried to be met by the group. And this really helps us a lot also because all the people in the lab are now working according to the same standards. So also when there are specific questions, they can ask their direct peers about feedback and help. So this really helped to make the workflow much more efficient in my group. And as all of this uh, work, we actually were awarded with this uh, quality system accreditation, large march, uh, and we're very pleased to be able to reach this state and looking forward to the future where we hope to further improve the quality system um, to in the end really boost innovation but also by ensuring the generation of robust and reliable, uh, reliable preclinical data. So with that, I would like to end and uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Martin, for this uh, uh, nice uh, uh, like overview and also walk through uh, the system and um, yeah. Maybe you can stop sharing the, the, the screen.
So, uh, and with that, I think we hand things over to uh, Piotr uh, Popik, uh, who joins us from Krakow. Um, I, Elke, uh, I think we save these questions then for, for the end, you know, so let's just hear from, from Piotr. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank for the invitation and for the, for the possibility to, you know, to, to share my uh, experience with Equip. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, Martin's uh, presentation was extremely well organized informative and uh, and and i have nothing to say i mean not, nothing to add uh, because i agree uh, 100 200 percent with all he said uh, my presentation perhaps i misunderstood the uh, the reason of uh, why uh, why why we do this uh, zoom meeting because because last time uh, I, I was only once, and I, I observed uh, the Israeli researcher uh, Lior Bikovsky uh, presentation, which was very un not informal and uh, funny and uh, nice. So, so I let me do this quickly and uh, and uh, three major uh, uh, things. First of all, uh, it started maybe 20 years ago when uh, Anton and Anton Bespalov and, and myself were not able to repeat some studies and uh, we were thinking to establish a journal of irreproducible research. So, and, and, uh, and then uh, Anton went to, Anton went to, to Germany and uh, was has had other things to do. So, but 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 you know the the frustration that you cannot rep replicate someone's uh, um, research is is very uh, damaging for people. So so we were discussing how to identify this, uh, this the the reasons of 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 being unable to to replicate. And uh, and then and then uh, a few years uh, ago, uh, there were meetings, uh, various meetings at various le levels, and I, I even don't understand how how this um, organization work because it changes, uh, you know. It, it's difficult to understand, but what what is what is uh, what is what is very easy to understand is that. That we need some kind of quality system that would organize the way we do research, and and here it all depends on. I'm talking to people who are considering to build uh, to to stick to the rules or not, and uh, and uh, and it, it all depends on on uh, on on the let's say culture of in in your environment. My uh, my lab. Uh, so, so uh, in my lab, uh, I was always crazy to 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 be as precise and as you know honest as possible. And uh, I learned this uh, during my uh, my PhD training in in the Netherlands in Utrecht and postdoc in the States and. Uh, so I, I, it was not not difficult for me to just 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 represent what we do, how we do experiments according to the frame, because because it was it was actually it was that was easy part. What what is difficult is to collect all the documents. For instance, how the animal room works, because in my uh, institute. Uh, nobody um, was prepared to answer things like, uh, for instance, well, you have to provide several technical details, and, and and this is not an easy thing, because people say, yeah, 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 we have this uh, document somewhere, I don't know where, and I I find it for you, and two weeks later they they really find the, the documents how the animal room works, 
and uh, you know what kind of food they uh, chow they uh, they order uh, for the animals so this is the paperwork is difficult and you you can get frustrated if if you if you don't 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 have uh, help from the from above and i didn't why we did it uh, because for two reasons because of the prestige because uh, because i thought i invested so much in the quality of uh, work of my lab so that uh, it and and also in the in the in the in the creation of uh, equip so it would be just unfair not to have no, not to have a diploma not to have certificate um the other equally or more important reason was to to organize things and to put them in a, in a, in a, in a formal frame which was not that difficult um uh it all starts with the with the way you 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 deal with data with 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 the with the with the process of doing research um we always have uh, we we people complain that uh, that uh, people complain that um because because uh, lab chiefs have uh, several phd students or postdocs they have their own laptops they store data on their laptops then they leave and nobody knows where the data are and what was the protocol and whether they were females or or male uh, mice or rats uh in my lab is it is strictly pro prohibited to store anything related to work on the you know desktop of the of the of, of the of, of the laptop it is it is it is prohibited and and if and if somebody is not uh, sticking to this rule he or she gets uh, you know a warning and 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 a, and a red card yellow card or, or the red card and uh, and moves the data into the proper place which all always have been a, a centralized server by so-called centralized server i mean uh, a linux machine you know uh, a, a, a windows server whatever we have uh, we have now a very big uh, like 36 terabytes of, of data but but you can start with uh, you know very simple computer that is able to manage uh, user accounts and as martin said everybody is able to read everything but only the owner of the of the of the folder her or his folder can write there so so everybody can read my data protocols my uh, you know letters and everything and nobody can change this except myself and of course the 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 owner the 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 root administrator who can do this with so it's easy for, for somebody who takes care of data it's easy it's also <clears throat> we don't have central we don't have a formal help like in name uh, Groningen uh, right in Martin's lab from the from the university because 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 we don't so i um I, I i take care of the of the backups and i do this on several disks and locations clouds and everything because i'm crazy this is this is why uh, other people you know they complain that they lost the data and uh, i can always dig dig into into some disk to to, to get them and uh, in my case uh, in my case uh, was it easy no it wasn't uh, first of all uh, several uh, old i mean uh, young uh, 40 uh, 50 po postdocs they, they were enthusiastic why do you do this we do research right we do we 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 describe all the all our mistakes we we take care of uh, data integrity we we keep order in, in why 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 do this why to formalize these things so so i said uh, i said uh, uh, 
Yeah. Yes, you you. Yes, you do. You do your research right. We are leaders in our area, etc. And but 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 we have to we have to sign that we have to we have to uh, change few things. We have to change few things, and uh, and sign uh, that that will keep this uh, that will stick to these uh, rules forever. So it wasn't easy, and I have to say. No, okay, part two is uh, the presentation, which is, I don't know how, uh, how helpful it is, but uh, yeah, so I work at the Institute of Pharmacology, my is, 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 the, is the former, can you see it? My is, uh, Professor Mai was uh, founder, you know, he was one of the heroes uh, of 70s, 80s, 90s um, of, of, of psychopharmacology. And we work not at the university, but at the Polish Academy of Sciences. So the, the, the Institute is a leading center in neuropsychopharmacology. We do it from, from, the, from the street, it looks like this. You, don't, you can't see anything because it's uh, you know, occluded by trees, but we live in, the, in a big park and uh, yeah, something like this. So what we do is uh, we study the mechanism of uh, brain function dysfunctions, search for the sy synthesis of new compounds as a, as a therapeutics. So there is a strong chemistry department. Uh, there are molecular biologists. There are you know. Um, <clears throat> simple behavioral pharmacologists like myself, uh, electrophysiology is there. Uh, he, this is the institute from, from the above. My office is, is here. Now, my office is here and, uh, and, uh, and this is the, 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 the animal lab. So it is connected with the, with the main building. So if somebody is doing an uh, experiment, he or she goes through the, through the long corridor, changes the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the coat and, uh, and, 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 and stays there for the whole day. We study uh, depression, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, substance use disorders, neurodegenerative disorders and chronic pain. The there's a lot of young people, you know, PhD students, the Hall of Fame of our directors is here. And uh, yeah, and what, what else? Um, the, the Institute is famous because we, uh, because due to Professor Mai, uh, all of us. At certain time, we we worked on the uh, on on the on the pathophysiology of depression and how antidepressant drugs work, and and we are famous because of this. Yeah. Um, we do we organize meetings, and uh, this is normal. The institute was established in nineteen seventy four, actually. 20, actually 20 years earlier, uh, as you see, this is uh, all the Austro-Hungarian kind of building. Department of Pharmacology was there in, in the center of city, but now it's, a, it's an old story. Uh, we, we moved in 1974 to the, to the newer place about 200 uh, people work, 14 departments, and, and six labs. Uh, we are on the Wiki Wikipedia, so you can you can uh, find it. Yeah, and this is my uh, my certificate, my my diploma. So, what I wanted to say is that uh, while uh, it's not easy to convince all of your colleagues and lab members. For my, for me, it was impossible to convince any other lab chief to do the same. 
because they said, uh, yeah, what are the benefits? Prestige, you know, you organize your work, you, you, you keep an order, you, you, you have all those things. And they say, nah, we have, we have everything here and, uh, and, and why do this extra effort? For, for, my, for myself, it was impossible to convince anybody. There were, uh, Bjorn had a lecture, Anton had a lecture, and, uh, and, and, and people were, are not interested. So I wanted to, to just, just to, uh, to show the environment I work. And as to the specific points, which are very, which, which sound very uh, difficult and formal, and uh, they are not. They, they, <laughs> they are not uh, difficult to follow once you go through them and understand the structure. So in my institute, pro probably as in yours, everything starts with the ethical pro product proposal. So every experiment, for every, first of all, everybody, every researcher has to have a, a, a license to do a behavior experiment, either as an observer, as a, as a performer, as a planning person. I have a planning person license, but I don't have a performing uh, person license, something like this. So, and, and somebody who kills the animals, etc. So there are different levels. Uh, if I would like to have license for all possibilities, I would have to spend like probably four weeks on the on the on the courses. That's why I, I don't have it. And then and then we write an ethical proposal in which every detail is listed. If I if I'm going to test um, antidepressant like activity of a new compound, I have to say its structure, where it comes from, the doses, positive control, negative control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, it's like a, you know experiment which looks which which will have uh, four bars. What a, a figure with four bars. This is like uh, fifty pages of, pa of of paper, and then such and so, uh, and the, and because, and then we have allowance to study new compounds for depression. And uh, and because this is so detailed, in which room you will do the experiment? What kind of chow would you would you feed your animals, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, any, um, how to say, any um, disobedience to this uh, rule uh, results in the, the the lab is closed. And if you repeat uh, uh, such a such a such a disobedience, then the institute can be can be closed. And this is thanks to our animal activists uh, movement, who is probably the strongest in uh, in, in in Europe. So. So it all starts with ethical protocol. Then we have like, then they have like one month to consider and another month to accept. In my lab, it's impossible to do experiments from the idea to 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 to, to, to data in 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 less than two months because of this, which is good because it uh, restricts. Uh, the... Piotr, Piotr, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, could you wrap up so we have time for questions? Oh yeah. Um, uh, okay, um, I, I think I said everything I wanted and, uh, yeah, I stopped here. Sorry. I, okay. I misunderstood. No, Thank no, no, no. I, no, uh, we'd be loved to listen to you and also to, to explain uh, all the process, but unfortunately, so we just have uh, one hour for, for this reserved. We have two speakers this time, so uh, um, so that, that was good sort of like to also hear a contrasting uh, approach and experience. So th thank you both very much. So uh, the floor is open for, for questions from the audience. Please go ahead. Don't be shy.
Can we just go ahead and ask a question then directly? Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks for the presentations today. I was particularly interested in uh, Professor Cart's your presentation on implementation, and I have a couple of questions about that. Um, the monitoring tool, did you code that yourself or was it part of your electronic um, lab book? Uh, I think you were using eJournal. Correct, so that's what we're using. No, that was actually developed in-house. So, no, so the tracking system we developed ourselves. And, and how can you comment on how was that a big project to develop or was there a resource in your institute to develop such code? It seems a very useful thing to monitor the, it's a project management tool, it seems, as well as a quality system tool. So Yeah, yeah, but we basically, as I said, we discuss these items on a regular basis with the group. And basically what we do is, so at that time, Renata was driving this initiative, so we had shared a data a task to implement such a tracking system and then once in a while she comes by with the group and presents it and say okay these are the items that we have identified should we extend it what is missing and then as a group we decide how we can develop this further and then based on the feedback she's filling out and basically developing such a system so it's really a co-creation that, that that's what we try to do okay thank you so, so by that way, we also make everybody owner of the of kind of the process and, 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 and the system. So by giving everybody the opportunity to think along and, and provide input. Yeah. Which goes along, you mentioned um, uh, earlier on, it's a culture that you create as much as a series of rules. Um, and that would seem to, to go along with that as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's the first step. You first have to create the culture and then people are willing to come along. And, uh, but actually make them part of the whole process. That's, I think, uh, an important aspect. Okay. Let me add that, the, 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 if I may, that the, everybody already has kind of culture because without culture, research is impossible. It, it only depends how, you know, how, how deeply you want to, to, to tell the people how should they do research. And uh, and because everybody knows to a certain extent, Martin, would you would you would you agree? Yes, but but I mean there are very much cultural differences, right? I mean, it, for example, I gave the example on how you discuss errors that are being made in the lab, and I mean that is that is can be quite a critical topic to discuss. But if you make that an open discussion and basically so that other, everybody can learn from that, and uh, I think that that is. That is not a culture you see everywhere, right? So, I mean, and, and yeah. And, and, and I think it's also part of the culture in, in, in my group that we discuss such a system. So everybody is really contributing and thinking in that way. And I don't think that's happening everywhere. Well, well, I'm not sure uh, there are labs that, uh, you know, do not tolerate uh, mistakes, errors, and uh, and things. The first thing a young investigators learns from 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 me is a. It is it is you don't have to provide the uh, to prove that the compound is acting or 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 is curing depression or something. We are interested in uh, you know satisfying our curiosity, not in proving anything. And number two, everybody is prone to errors. You can you if if you if, if you if you if you took uh, rat number two instead of rat number one, and 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 and, and observe uh, the animal, you just have to put with the pencil. I made a, a mistake, and uh, this is the result of the other animal. But uh, and, and what is not tolerated and. Uh, is 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 that uh, somebody is not sticking to this rule? This is not tolerated, but but everybody, yeah, it's 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 so human. I agree, Christopher. You said you had multiple questions, so keep so, them coming. Uh, depending on others' interest, my my second yeah. question then would be uh, actually to you, Rene, but as well to, to Martin, who's been through the process. It seems a really key part of the system is the definition of exploratory versus knowledge claiming. And I wondered if, Martin, if you could talk through a little bit how you applied those two definitions 
because uh, that that actually seems quite key also to getting people to buy in who are quite in my experience quite cautious about we don't want unnecessary paperwork for example yeah no uh that's a fair point uh i have to uh go back to the paperwork because this was a recent discussion with so how we actually in the end formulated it uh but i'm more than happy to share it to the folks online once i've definitely confirmed it so i have to go back to the paperwork to make sure but this is not really it's in the order of if you're able to reject the null hypothesis, basically. Um, that, that is where it's about. So it's not really about replicating another study, what, what most of the people think if you think about a confirmatory study. But that not, that's not what it necessarily is. Okay, do, do you have any further comments, Rene, on that as well? I, I'm trying to get a sense of, for example, uh, a preclinical experiment, uh, experiment yeah. that involves therapy, where you're actually saying, I expect this as a result of the therapy, and to what extent that could ever be classed as exploratory, for example? Well, I mean, we um, we, we often lump them together. And that, I think that is the mistake, that we sort of like create an hypothesis out of a theorem that exists in literature, and then we just apply some 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 animals, and so then 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 we do it. So, but we don't know that system uh, really well, sort of that that we study in, initially. So we we have to initially really explore. And uh, I think currently sometimes the thinking and the funding scheme sort of prevent us sort of like from going into this. Sometimes it's advisors sort of like that certain steps slow us down. But that is actually the proper approach to say is like, hmm, okay, is there really sort of like a relationship between variable A and variable B in this model that we want to study? And let's see sort of in a limited number of, of, of animals, uh, what is happening? So, and, and see whether anything is going in direction or is this a flatliner? Uh, entirely and uh, and with that information that 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 we have we can really then explore from there we can extrapolate what variants exist we can do prop more proper assumptions about the sample size calculation and the variants that, that we have and we can use other techniques than just simple uh, um, uh, um, uh, statistics, but actually going into actual uh, looking into data in every data point that is there, uh, triangulate with other factors that we also uh, uh, collected and and make sort of like is there a correlation just there and and is it really worth it to go deeper and uh, and then we can go into confirmatory stuff and uh, I think. The, the 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 real question is, and that was also one of the points, is how much rigor do you already want to apply to uh, uh, these exploratory uh, elements in terms of randomization of of, of blinding and and so on, and uh, and or how open do, do do you keep this? And and I think there is no real sort of like good advice, sort of like. Uh, because it 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 gets sort of then all of a sudden really resource poor and, and, and expensive, mm -hmm. and I think this is where people then have problems. It's like, mm, yeah, uh, um, why not do a real study out of this if you go through this eff effort, so yeah. uh, so to speak? And uh, yeah, I don't know what the experts have to say on this from the practical field. Well, you can have a study where you have. Uh, a, a confirmatory component and, and 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 usually you have exploratory components so you can right. actually, that's usually the case or well actually most of the research i think is, is probably considered exploratory uh, but in case you have a confirmatory study you can have additional exploratory elements uh, as part of your study um yeah i think kim had her hand did you want to respond kim as well or maybe on this topic well, I got excited when Renee mentioned the sample size calculation because any study that is looking to confirm a null hypothesis needs to be powered. And to calculate power, you need pilot data because you need an estimation of your variance and the difference between means if you're doing a simple t-test that you find uh, relevant. So uh, that makes it impossible to combine both the piloting and the confirmation into one because you won't have any data to base your 
confirmatory study on unless you have pilot data. And if those are pilot data, then you're not yet sure about your hypothesis, probably. So um, yeah, that is one of the things that as a, a sort of a statistician light, uh, I found uh, very interesting. When you're trying to combine it, it's always a chicken and the egg situation. How did you know how to power if you didn't have a pilot? <laughs> Um, uh, what I was trying to say is that you could have a confirmatory study based on an earlier study, but yes, frequently you can do do exploratory analysis. No, definitely, and you will probably have an exploratory um, set of outcomes that you are just uh, interested in, for which you haven't powered, and then you're looking at trends and uh, maybe well, you can speculate or discuss whether you should use inferential statistics for that. Uh, but a confirmatory study, uh, I think, should have at least one hypothesis that is powered and that you're aiming to test to confirm whether that hypothesis is true. But it, 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 this is a great discussion. Um, but I think also uh, experimental design it, it forms a lot of the training materials that are available on, on the KIPD website, for example. But I think even things like randomization, blocking, uh, and blinding can apply to both studies, perhaps, because they, they it's a way of handling variation and extracting more meaning from the data then. E even before you get to powering, block randomization where you know this may affect the results, for example. I, I think, it's slightly uh, off topic, so apologies. <laughs> I think this, uh, my understanding is similar, but I can summarize it uh, in, in, in one sentence. Uh, exploratory study is 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 a crazy study. You you walk on the street, you think a compound uh, that nobody earlier thought it would uh, work may work, and and you, and, and you inject few mice and and see an effect or not. This is my understanding. Whereas and and you cannot claim that it means anything. It it gives you a. a you know, some impression that it's worth uh, uh, a proper study, well designed, uh, randomized, etc. This is my understanding, and we don't, we rather don't do this uh, because because it's too crazy. This is my understanding. Yeah, I think that's at least a good example of an exploratory study. <laughs> yeah. But there might be other scenarios. But I think, yeah, it's a cost benefit uh, analysis because if you are able to randomize and blind already in your exploratory study, you reduce the risk that you find uh, these exploratory trends uh, uh, through bias. And that will save you the cost of doing a confirmatory experiment uh, where there's actually nothing to be uh, confirmed. But if you have a setup where it's very costly to blind and randomize because you need a lot of personnel and the intervention is clearly visible, uh, then that might be too difficult for an exploratory study. And you take the risk that you might be influenced by bias, uh, but you, you, you go with the, the, the findings for future hypothesis testing anyway. And then maybe your confirmatory study is a neutral study. So, but, but is, is it perhaps then that you at least still have to have a hypothesis though? Otherwise you're in the realm of harking and doing an experiment and going, oh, it showed this, th this is now the new hypothesis, which is which is much more likely to be random. Yeah, for I exploratory, it, yeah, oh, go ahead, Peter. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it is always driven by a hypothesis. Uh, although, although in the, in the, yeah, you, my understanding is that you, that you cannot have both. For instance, if if my idea is that uh, the 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 you know you can you can talk to the elephant and an elephant will understand you, and you have to design several groups, randomized, blinded, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it's easier to to just to talk to single uh, elephant and see that the elephant is is not uh, you know understanding. So. So, and that the hypothesis was false. So even if I increase N to a proper N, it still will not work. So, so that's why we, I mean, th there is the, such a distinction. That was the, actually the, 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 the most difficult uh, part of the, of, the, of the list for us.
Yeah, thank you for the discussion. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, thanks uh, for uh, this question, Christopher. Um, any other questions from uh, the remaining participants here? Hi, um, I have a quick question, if that's okay. Yeah. And that, that's just about how would we go about accreditation if we were interested? With what? Oh, about oh. what? I, I couldn't hear. About, I think this, this question is to, 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 to us um, about the yeah. accreditation process. Uh, yeah. Well, you uh, you can contact uh, uh, us, and uh, and I think we can set a, a process in, in motion. So first of all, but you should actually have a look at the at the system yourself, download it, uh, look at it, and see uh, uh, whether you can actually fulfill the, these eighteen core requirements. And if you have any questions with this, you you can contact us, and uh, and then you do basically see a self check and uh, um, and after you perform the self check and you are sort of like in a in a convinced that you fulfilled these then i think the the accreditation step come in by contacting us and we contact uh, then pass which is the operational arm for us and they would do then the the assessment but uh, i think first is uh, that you familiarize yourself with these 18 core requirements and uh, maybe uh, Martin and Piotr, you can maybe add something uh, to that. What would be good to know, or from your experiences, to add if somebody's interested in uh, in the process of assessment, what they need to do. Yeah, you said this uh, perfectly. Uh, go through the uh, uh, core requirements and and see whether it is theoretically possible to 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 stick to this and and, and whether the effort prevails and uh, i mean uh, whether the the results prevail over the effort and uh, yeah okay thank you and are there any cost implications with accreditation are there any cost implications? so so in my initial accreditation was because I was one of the first doing it through the equipped consortium. So in that, that case, there was no cost associated. Yeah. Um, I think for the reaccreditation, there is a, a few hundred euros, I think, involved, but I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, but it's in that order. Okay, okay, that sounds good, thank you. And are there, maybe if you are interested to read our paper, so the best follow-up paper who describes the, uh, the, the quality system and, and maybe our response, I'm not sure whether you're in an academic setting, but we- No, I, um, I, I worked for a small CRO um, originally. We, um, we kind of were a spin out from an academic lab, so I feel quite academic, um, but actually we, uh, we are now a CRO. Well, at least we tried to describe a little bit our experience while implementing the system. So that may be useful as an uh, as an example. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Our, our CRO uh, works with preclinical models of Parkinson's disease. So I think um, I think this system is 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 very appropriate for that. Yeah, no, de definitely. I think the system is also written for CROs for small industries and. Uh, 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 with this common standards th that uh, everybody agrees on, it's also perfectly sort of for the intersection of uh, academia and industry. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it sounds great. Just keep us in mind, yeah. For sure. <laughs> uh, maybe I can ask uh, uh, one question. So, I mean, you, you're all doing this and uh, it seems like, I mean, you, you are quality driven. Uh, and you put, uh, as you said, like both a lots of effort into this. So how do your colleagues at your institution, uh, I mean, like purely you reacted to a little bit, uh, reflect on this? Or they sort of like call you crazy? Or is that something where people then look at it like, hmm, uh, actually, uh, uh, Martin or Piotr are really onto something. And uh, um so is there a, a discussion, uh, a culture uh, regarding the system since they are not so popular yet or this discussed about? Martin, please start. Oh, okay. Well, in my case, uh, I don't think people 
look uh, weird about it, but they, they, they are a little bit hesitant to start implementing because they also realize that it requires a time investment. So, but there is not much, well, if, if there is an issue that people discussed and they said, well, you know, you can, you can basically resolve this by having such a system in place. So it's, I, I, I point to it if, if there is actually an issue and then they say, well, you know, if you would have compl be compliant with this system, actually that would be in place. Um, so I try to educate them uh, during, let's say, uh, current accidents or something <laughs> that happen. I try to say, well, you know, you could have maybe prevented that to happen while you're having such a system in place. So, but yeah, I, I purposely did it by my own group because I realized it's it's a time investment. Um, but I, with the intention that I hope that people would uh, pick up on it. Um, but that has not yet happened. Yeah. I may only add that uh, I disagree with uh, with one point of Martin. If people, if somebody wants to cheat, he or she will will cheat, and 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 it takes time and takes uh, a lot of investigation to to find that. Because so the, the so it's the system is not to uh, eliminate uh, intentional cheating. It is it is rather to to organize things. And why why other labs are not uh, interested? I don't know. Probably because they uh, they feel it's not necessary. It's like a good restaurant. Uh, the cook says we we cook very well. We feed people. It's tasty. It's fresh. La la la, etc. We don't have Mich Michelin uh, sticker on it. So what? Uh, we still uh, we still do things right. And 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 everybody has to accept this and and and, and respect this. Um, uh, my uh, feeling is that uh, we, you know, create kind of, uh, you know. <laughs> We put some extra effort, and and we should be recognized for for this. Uh, not uh, just 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 you know psychologically, mentally recognized by uh, I don't know uh, grant givers or uh, the editors. I don't know. Um, uh, what do you think? <laughs> Well, just to respond, I was not referring to any cheating. I was more referring to more practical aspects like data loss or those type of things. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's definitely, yeah. yeah true. So, and, and, and loss of protocols. And, and these things are all organized. So I think in the end, it's really efficient to have it all in place. Yeah. Right. And maybe people should start to think about that. It's a long-term investment. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I like the idea of the Michelin uh, star. That's good. Um, Kim, I, I'll leave you to, to the, the last words here, please. Well, I think uh, uh, it was a really nice uh, session today. Again, where I find it interesting that we keep revisiting some topics of the previous uh, webinar. So if you're interested in, for instance, the hypothesis testing and uh, non-hypothesis testing studies there is actually another webinar on it that you can view on the equip website <laughs> where we discuss it once more um otherwise i'd like to thank piotr and martin again for their excellent uh, explanation of what the equipped quality system has meant for them and i'd like to thank all our attendees especially those who've been with us uh, for the whole series and uh, and thanks renee for uh, for co-hosting uh, several of the webinars with me. I think with that, we can conclude the entire series of uh, Go Equip webinars, and we can start preparing for uh, the next series. Um, and we may be sending around uh, a small survey on topics that you would like to see in the next series. So if you have already some ideas uh, popping into your head, uh, we'd like to hear about them. So I think with that, we can close. And I wish you a very good week and a day. Many thanks. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye. Bye.